Upon learning that his wife had performed on stage for foreigners for money, the husband bought a bracelet for his mistress with that money. And as soon as he gave the gift, the morning silence was broken by the soft sound of an alarm clock. Natalie quickly pulled her hand out from under the blanket and turned off the alarm. At that moment, she really wished she could just ignore everything and turn it off for good, sinking into sweet drowsiness. It seemed to her that with each passing day, she had less and less strength. Life felt like the running wheel of a squirrel she had once seen at the zoo. She could never have imagined that she would live each day like that. In her youth, Natalie dreamed of a completely different life. Orphaned at a young age, she was just over 17 when her parents died in a car accident. She worked diligently in university, knowing that she could no longer rely on anyone else. The professors were always praising her and held her up as an example. You don't appreciate the happiness of focusing on studies without worrying about anything else. Look, Natalie, the best student in the course. She even participates in extracurricular activities, and she has to work in the evenings. And you? Your parents feed you, take care of you, and you can't even be bothered to study properly. Indeed, she had to work in the evenings after classes as a courier at a travel agency, trying not to spend her parents' savings. She hoped to one day become a professional singer. Natalie couldn't imagine life without singing. From morning till night, she was ready to sing at every opportunity. No university concert was complete without her participation. At one such performance, a young man came up on stage, handed her a bouquet, kissed her hand, and quietly whispered, You have such an amazing voice. May I take you home today? Please, don't refuse. Natalie was so taken aback that she couldn't respond at that moment. Her heart was literally pounding out of her chest. She had seen this guy a few times at the university. He visited her classmate. That day, Gordon, that was his name, was waiting for her at the gate in an expensive car. He spent the whole evening driving her around the city, chatting about everything, while Natalie listened to every word with bated breath. It was impossible not to fall in love with Gordon. Tall and muscular, he seemed like he had stepped off the cover of a glossy magazine. Natalie knew in her mind that they were not a match. Gordon was one of those called rich kids, and she was just an ordinary, modest student. But she couldn't help it. From the very first moments of their communication, she fell in love and didn't want to think about anything else. Gordon courted her beautifully, almost every day meeting her after classes, and after a week, he stayed the night for the first time. Natalie already imagined how they would be happy together, getting married, raising children. But everything collapsed in an instant. One day, during a lecture, she suddenly felt unwell and her vision went dark. If it hadn't been for the professor catching her, she would have definitely fallen. Taking a leave, Natalie went to the clinic and, a few hours later, learned that she was pregnant. That evening she told Gordon, who replied, You know, I think we're too young to have children. You're still studying, and I'm not ready to be a father. Let me talk to a friend. His mother is a gynecologist, and we can have an abortion. Seeing her eyes fill with tears, he hugged her and gently said, Believe me, it will be better this way. We'll definitely have children later, you'll see. But not now. Natalie spent the entire night crying into her pillow. She wanted so much to keep the baby, but even more, she wanted to be with Gordon. Fearing he would leave her, she went to the doctor the next day as he suggested. Upon learning the reason for her visit, the doctor suddenly began to dissuade her. How foolish you are at this age. The doctor sighed. How can you deprive a living being of life? It already exists, and its heart is beating. Looking at Natalie in a way that sent shivers down her spine, she added. You could ruin your life with this decision, think carefully. If you decide to keep it, of course, come back. But I hope that the next time I see you, it will be only to register and monitor your pregnancy. Natalie left the clinic completely bewildered. Sitting on a bench in the park opposite, she thought for over an hour about what to do and increasingly agreed with the doctor. She really wanted the baby to be born, so she decided to keep it. 
Natalie went to her classes in a cheerful mood. After making the decision, she felt as though a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. Gordon, who had come to the university to see his friend, was surprised to see her. Aren't you at the hospital? Or do they do things so quickly? He asked. Natalie looked at him fearfully and said quietly, Gordon, I can't do this. I'm sorry, but I kept the baby. It has to be born. Natalie saw him like this for the first time, his face flushed, his eyes turned angry. He grabbed her by the elbow and, quickly pushing her, led her outside. Once they were alone, he almost yelled. Are you completely stupid? What child? I don't want him even for free. I want to live, to enjoy myself to the fullest. But you said you loved me, and that means you should love him too. He's ours. Natalie said with a trembling voice. Gordon laughed angrily, and his laughter made her heart tighten. After he finished laughing, he smirked and said, You're really stupid. What love? What are you talking about? If every girl I was with had a baby, I'd already be a hero dad. Natalie felt as if all of this was happening to someone else in a terrible nightmare. But it was real. Gordon left and never came back. Even if he saw her from a distance, he pretended not to know her and turned away. It was hard to convey to anyone what she went through at that time. Natalie could neither eat nor drink, and she slept only a few hours. Maggie Charlson, the gynecologist who had dissuaded her and with whom she was registered, repeatedly scolded her. How can you torture yourself like this? You don't think about yourself, think about the baby. Why did you keep him? To make his life a misery now? You need to eat properly, sleep as much as possible, and you're just wearing yourself out. Maggie tried to help her in every possible way. Sometimes she would prescribe vitamins for free or bring berries or fruits from her garden. Natalie was very grateful for all of this but didn't understand how to move forward. Terrible morning sickness and constant depression led her to completely neglect her studies. The professors urged her to take an academic leave, but she didn't want to think about it. Now, years later, Natalie could barely remember how she managed to get through the delivery, which began a few weeks before the due date. Her son was born very weak and spent almost a month in the hospital. The doctors doubted from the beginning that the baby would survive, but he fought hard. Maggie Charlson, who visited Natalie, sadly said, It's like a curse, first, the mother didn't want him to be born, and now life itself won't let him come into this world properly. But don't worry, children like this, believe me, later become very strong. It's a test for him, and for you too. Natalie was grateful to fate for bringing her to this woman. Without the doctor, she didn't know what she would have done. Maggie Charlson continued to visit them even after they left the hospital, offering guidance and support to the young mother. She was the first person Natalie confided in about her son's dire diagnosis. Jeffrey had developmental delays. When asked what could cause this, the doctor replied, There could be a bunch of reasons. Infection, severe morning sickness, stress during pregnancy. Or, ultimately, just genetic predisposition. Upon learning this, Natalie blamed only herself. She really hadn't thought during the entire pregnancy that her own crying and depression could have caused such harm to her son. But it was too late to change anything. Now, after several years, she didn't even understand how she had survived back then. To buy all the essentials and manage to get by, she had to pawn almost all of her mother's jewelry. They were precious to her as mementos, but while her son was still very young, she couldn't find a job. Thus, she had almost no money for living expenses. When her son was just a year and a half old, she enrolled him in a nursery, the one closest to home. He wasn't accepted, as they didn't have a group for children with his diagnosis. Fortunately, Maggie Charlson found out where such children were accepted and even arranged for Jeffrey to be admitted. However, it required several bus stops and a crowded bus. But at least Natalie was able to return to work almost immediately. Finding a job for a young mother with no experience and incomplete education was difficult. 
Her doctor, having heard her sing once, suggested, Maybe you could work as a singer in a restaurant? I think they pay well and you'd at least get fed. But Natalie immediately rejected the idea. Oh no. I'm self-taught and afraid of the stage. At university, I used to take tranquilizers before going on stage for competitions. And Jeffrey is still so small, where would I leave him in the evenings? No, I can't be a singer. She truly said goodbye to her long-held dream of a singing career. The only job she could get was as a dishwasher. Natalie also put a cross on her personal life at that time, knowing well that no one would want to tie their life to hers, especially with a sick child. In essence, she had no time to think about herself. Mornings were spent taking her son to the nursery, rushing to work, picking him up after work, stopping by the store if needed, then home, and so on every day. But when her son turned two, she accidentally met Nicholas. That day, Natalie went to the nearest supermarket for bread. And as she approached the checkout, she saw a huge line. Trying to calm her fussy child, she quietly said, Well, just wait a little longer. We'll buy the bread and go home. But the baby didn't calm down and began tugging on her arm, pulling her toward the exit. Natalie was about to return the bread and abandon the purchase when suddenly the man standing right by the checkout smiled and offered, Stand in front of me. What are you doing, standing here with just bread and a child? Natalie thanked the stranger and, after paying for her purchase, left the store. While she was putting Jeffrey in the stroller, she heard the familiar velvety voice behind her. Are you going far? Let me give you a ride. Look at those clouds. You might get soaked. It was indeed about to rain, and the house was a ten-minute walk away. After a moment's thought, Natalie agreed. Well, there you go. You're helping me out for the second time today. How can I thank you? Nicholas smiled and immediately replied. The best way to thank me would be to agree to go on a date with me. How about dinner at a restaurant tonight? Are you kidding? What restaurant? Natalie said in alarm and then quickly added. I have a son, and I don't have anyone to leave him with. Nicholas drove her home and, at the entrance, said, You know, I really liked you. How about I pick you up tomorrow, and we can all go for a walk in the park with Jeffrey? Are you up for it? Natalie was surprised, but, unexpectedly for herself, agreed. From that day on, Nicholas began courting her. He brought flowers, took her and her son out of town on weekends. Natalie couldn't say that she had developed any feelings for this man, but one thing she understood, she felt calm and at ease with him. A few months after they met, Nicholas proposed. And Natalie, without much thought, agreed. There were no passionate feelings or infatuation between them, everything was steady and even. In the first year, Nicholas tried to help with household chores. Sometimes he would drop off and pick up Jeffrey, but over time, he did it less and less. He was away at work more often and frequently went on business trips. At first, Natalie couldn't understand why an ordinary procurement officer needed to travel. He used to manage without leaving the office, but her husband would only respond irritably. Don't meddle in what's not your business. How should I know why? The bosses think it's necessary, so I go. Or do you want me to lose my job? Of course, Natalie didn't want that. They were barely making ends meet, and there was hardly enough money for the basics. She couldn't even afford to pay for child psychology sessions for Jeffrey. At five years old, Jeffrey's development was still at the level of a one-year-old. She continued to take him to a special group where most of the children had similar conditions. But the other parents could afford extra classes, which showed results. The caregivers were not pleased that Jeffrey didn't attend these classes and expressed their frustration to her openly. Do you understand that your son is uncontrollable? Is it really that hard to find money for a specialist? How could she explain that her dishwasher salary was only enough for a couple of sessions and she was too embarrassed to ask her husband for money? Natalie was grateful to Nicholas for marrying her but understood perfectly that Jeffrey remained a stranger to him. 
so she tried not to burden him with such problems. Sometimes she thought that this marriage might not have been necessary. Nicholas's help around the house became less and less. He never really offered to do anything. When the plumbing broke, Natalie would immediately ask friends to fix it. If a nail needed hammering or a cabinet needed to be moved, she struggled on her own. Her husband's response was always, I'm exhausted. Leave me alone. I'll get to it on my day off. When the day off came, he either ended up on another business trip or slept until noon, then watched an action movie and lay on the couch with a beer until evening. Gone were the days of outings and park walks. Sometimes Natalie felt like they were living like neighbors. But, afraid of being alone again, she had to endure this life. Lost in her thoughts, Natalie didn't notice that she had walked all five stops from Jeffrey's nursery to her restaurant. Upon entering the establishment, she immediately noticed some unusual hustle and bustle. Jerome Crockett, the director, was giving out orders nervously and, upon seeing her, immediately said, So, everything has to shine today. We have investors coming from abroad, ready to invest in our development. This is a chance to finally breathe easy. I hope you all won't let me down. Natalie greatly respected her boss, as did most of the staff. He always knew how to listen, help if needed, and support. It was said that he was kind and fair. He had achieved everything in life by himself, which everyone knew. He was a real hard worker. He could spend from morning till night at work, trying to control and improve every process. At first, he hoped that his son Arnold would follow in his footsteps. But at 20, Arnold only drank, partied, and spent his father's money. The director was a little over 60, and if a couple of years ago, it was hard to tell his age, recently, he had been showing signs of aging. It was evident that managing such a large establishment alone was becoming difficult, so he was thrilled with the investor's interest. Natalie changed into her work clothes and went to her job. She enjoyed being alone, and as she washed the dishes she had left from the evening, she began to hum her favorite song quietly. It was the only place where she could sing, even if just softly. At home, when she once started singing in the kitchen without noticing, her husband had said disapprovingly, Listen, can you at least keep it quiet at home? There's noise all day at work, and now you're singing too. Since then, she allowed herself to sing only at work, while alone with the piles of dirty dishes. From Marilyn, the waitress, she learned that the investors had arrived on time. Hurrying by with a tray of dirty dishes, Marilyn whispered, Such distinguished men, in expensive suits and ties, a real sight. And they're walking around the restaurant like they own the place, checking every corner. So, watch out. They might come by here too. Natalie smirked without looking up from her work. Let them come by. Maybe they'll see something new. Everything is fine here. I hope they won't find any faults. Marilyn ran off, and Natalie started humming the song she had heard on the radio. She became so engrossed that she didn't notice when the foreigners appeared at the entrance. They listened to her for a few minutes, after which one of the men, addressing the director, suddenly said with an accent, this voice is simply divine. Why isn't the lady on stage? This is a talent. Please, I beg you, have her sing properly into the microphone right now. I want to hear this. Natalie looked at the director with frightened eyes, signaling that she didn't want to do it. But the investor continued. Just please sing in our language. We'll record it and show it to our boss. He's abroad but loves and knows a lot about music. Natalie timidly said, But I don't know your language and have never sung in a foreign language before. The man quickly discussed something with his companions and then explained that he would write out the lyrics for her in a way that she could read even without knowing their language. Your task is to sing well to your tune, the man added with a smile. After a moment's thought, Natalie agreed. The offer seemed interesting. Singing on stage was more appealing to her than washing mountains of dirty dishes. She quickly changed, and when she came out into the hall, the foreigners were already sitting at one of the tables. The man who spoke the local language quickly got up to meet her and handed her a sheet of paper. 
Here, take this, he said with a smile. I hope it's clear. Natalie began to read, silently moving her lips. Then she looked at Jerome Crockett, the director, with concern and said barely audibly, I don't think I can do this. It looks like gibberish to me. But the foreigner, without letting the boss respond, said, With your voice, you need to be confident. You're a miracle, remember that. So, please, go on stage. After rehearsing for a few minutes on the side while the foreigners set up the camera, she crossed herself and stepped onto the stage. The first few lines were sung with a trembling voice, but then something seemed to click inside her, and Natalie began to sing in a way that she herself enjoyed. She didn't understand the foreign words or know what she was singing about, but she tried to put her whole soul into each note. When the song ended, there was a profound silence in the hall. Only then did she notice that almost all her colleagues were gathered at the door. After a minute's pause, enthusiastic applause broke out, and the foreigners even stood up from their seats to show their admiration. Slightly coming to her senses, Natalie saw that one of the investors was speaking to someone via video call. Then he got up and walked towards her. Today is our boss's birthday, and this song was for him. He said it was the best gift and ordered that a reward be transferred to your account as a thank you for the song. Natalie stood there, bewildered, blinking, and said, But I don't have an account. The man laughed and continued, Oh, right. I forgot that in your country people prefer cash. He took out his wallet, counted out the bills, and handed the money to Natalie. Then, thinking for a moment, he took out a couple more new bills and, putting them in her hand, said, And this is for me personally. You have a divine voice. Believe me, I know about these things too. She couldn't fully comprehend what had just happened. After thanking them, Natalie went to the storeroom and only there realized that the amount of money the foreigner had given her was enough to last three months without working. She understood perfectly well that for people who were looking to develop the restaurant business, this was just a small amount. But for her, it was a fortune that had unexpectedly fallen into her lap. Struggling to wait until the end of the workday, Natalie picked up her son from the daycare and hurried home. She was eager to share the good news with Nicholas. To her surprise, he was already home that evening, and Natalie, right from the doorstep, excitedly began to tell him about the arrival of the foreigners, the singing offer, and the reward she had received. As if to confirm her words, she pulled out a stack of banknotes and laid them on the table in front of her husband. He examined the money for a long time, running his fingers over the bills, then pushed them aside and said sadly, I'm happy for you. Maybe you'll become a star, unlike me. Natalie was taken aback. She had expected a completely different reaction. Why are you saying that? She said quietly, I thought you'd be happy for me. Her husband suddenly changed his expression and, lifting his sad eyes to her, said in a barely audible voice, I'm happy for you, but right now I'm not in the mood for it. I'm done for. I wanted to make some money for us, took a small loan from the company, arranged for a shipment, and those bastards screwed me over, no goods, no money. Making a tragic face, he looked at his wife with tearful eyes. If I don't return the full amount soon, they'll press charges against me. He fell silent and, cradling his head in his hands, stared silently at the floor. It seemed like he might burst into tears any moment. Natalie quietly sat down on a chair next to him and, pushing the stack of money closer, asked, Is this enough? If it is, take it. As they say, what came, can go. If it wasn't here, it's no big deal. Nicholas looked up at her and, kissing her hand, said softly, Thank you, dear. Thank you, my love. You can't even imagine what you've done for me. I'll repay the debt tomorrow, and we'll earn more together. He took the money and went to the room. Natalie sat there, thinking that the foreigners had come into her life at just the right time. Surely, to help Nicholas avoid prison. She really believed this and couldn't even imagine what her hard-earned money would be spent on. Nicholas had already decided everything, and first thing in the morning, even though it was a weekend, he left. I can't wait until Monday, 
I'll go out of town. I know where our boss lives, and I'll pay back the entire amount today. At the door, he turned around and added, Don't wait up for me this evening. I'll be late. The boss's dacha is quite far. It'll be a while to get there, back, and everything. Natalie was about to say that it wasn't very good to bother the boss on a weekend, but decided to stay silent, knowing that Nicholas wouldn't appreciate it. She was sure that her husband went off to pay the debt while Nicholas, happily rubbing his hands together, wandered through jewelry stores choosing a gift. But that didn't concern Natalie. Unless you count that the purchase was planned with the money she had earned from singing. For several months, Nicholas had been trying to woo a young secretary. The slender blonde had simply enchanted him. He couldn't think of anything else but their next meeting. He invited her on dates, bought huge bouquets, but it seemed that it was hard to impress the girl with such things. When he heard about the money that had literally fallen from the sky to his wife, he immediately came up with a brilliant plan. There was no debt, no failed deal. He simply decided to play on his wife's sympathy, thinking of her as a simpleton and fool to get the money. He planned to use it to buy something that would finally melt Stephanie's heart. That was the name of the object of his affection. After visiting several jewelry stores, he was appalled by the prices and quality of the gold jewelry. What was decent cost as much as an airplane. And everything else looked clearly like cheap stuff. Exhausted, he suddenly noticed a pawn shop and immediately went there. He remembered that during the first year of their marriage, Natalie had told him she had pawned all her jewelry, including an old grandmother's ring. She had even shown a picture of the jewelry. Perhaps that's the kind of exquisite piece he would want for his young paramour. A friendly employee, upon learning the reason for his visit, immediately started showing him elegant options. Suddenly, among all the splendor, Nicholas saw a bracelet. With its black stones sparkling like scales, a snake with green eyes seemed to gaze at him. Understanding his interest, the saleswoman tried the bracelet on her wrist and said, A wonderful choice, only natural stones and gold-plated. Handmade, you won't find anything like it anywhere else. On the girl's wrist, it indeed looked magnificent. Nicholas, without hesitation, said, Please wrap it up. I'll take this marvel. He left the pawn shop in high spirits. Knowing that Stephanie was born in the year of the snake, he was almost certain she would like the gift. As he was about to head to her place to present it, he suddenly remembered that her main condition for meetings was that he had to call. Stephanie didn't pick up right away and grumbled on the phone. Is it something urgent? I'm busy. Sorry. I bought something for you, Nicholas said playfully. I can't wait until Monday. I'd like to give it to you right now. The girl was silent for a minute, then unexpectedly said, Sorry, don't come over. Aunt promised to visit. I don't think she'd approve of me meeting with a married man. But she immediately added, You know, I'm going to the store in about ten minutes. We can meet briefly in the park where we last walked. Nicholas didn't like this much. He was hoping for a meeting, but he was also afraid to object. He couldn't even imagine Stephanie ending their relationship. He agreed and went to the meeting place. Stephanie showed up a little late and indifferently said, So, what happened? What did you buy? I hope you didn't drag me out of the house just for another box of chocolates. Nicholas, gazing at her lovingly, took out the bracelet from a small velvet pouch and ceremoniously put it on his beloved's wrist. Stephanie examined the jewelry for a few minutes and then said graciously, It's a nice piece. I do like things like this. Seems like a unique item. Nicholas was expecting more enthusiastic reactions, gratitude, a kiss, at least. But Stephanie accepted the gift coolly. Sorry, I'm almost out of time. Aunt should be arriving any moment, and I still need to buy something for the table. Nicholas, believing her, went home, not suspecting what these so-called ants could be like. Meanwhile, his lover, upon returning home, shouted from the threshold, Darling, I'm home. There was such a queue at the store, I had to stand it at the checkout for almost an hour. Sorry, we'll have lunch now. A young man, whose arms and chest were covered in tattoos, came out of the room. 
All the images indicated a clear prison past, despite his rather young age. Stephanie approached him and, wrapping her arms around his neck, said affectionately, Miss me? I can see you did. She wanted to kiss him on the cheek, but he suddenly grabbed her hand with the bracelet and asked oddly, Where did you get this? I haven't seen it among your trinkets before. Stephanie noticed that a look of fear flashed in her lover's eyes when he saw the bracelet. But she attributed this to jealousy and the fear of losing her. She actually enjoyed having a romance with two men at once. Her friend, upon learning of her latest escapades, would always say indignantly, How can you? It's so low, especially since one of them is married. Stephanie knew this, but she was perfectly fine with it. And to her friend, she would laugh and reply, You're such a fool, Sophie. It's great to have two men adoring you and showering you with gifts. Plus, it's very convenient. If you fight with one, the other replaces him. You'll never be alone. Her friend would only shake her head in despair. That evening, Ernest, the young man she was seeing, repeatedly tried to find out where the bracelet came from. But Stephanie kept brushing him off and changing the subject. Nicholas, believing in the arrival of the aunt and upset by his lover's indifferent reaction to the gift, went to a bar. He sat there almost until midnight, trying to drown his sorrows with cognac. When he returned home, he saw that Natalie was still awake. She rushed to meet him and anxiously asked, So, did you give the money? Is everything okay? Then she looked at her husband closely and, clutching her hands to her chest, said fearfully, You're drunk. How did you drive? Did something happen? Nicholas, trying to smile foolishly, mumbled, Everything's great, thanks. I'm saved. And drinking? Yeah, that was just at the bar, celebrating, ran into an old friend. Natalie had never seen her husband so drunk before, but she attributed it to the stress of the situation. She helped Nicholas undress and put him to bed. Well, that's good. It means the foreigners came for a reason. If it weren't for them, you'd be sitting in jail. But now, everything turned out fine. She truly believed that she had helped her husband avoid punishment without regretting for a second the money she had given away. A few days later, when Natalie went to work, Jerome Crockett asked the staff to gather in the hall. Once everyone was assembled, he joyfully announced, Well, the happy moment has arrived. Finally, my baby, my restaurant, will start transforming. Starting today, these foreign gentlemen will be my full-fledged partners. He turned toward the same investors who had asked Natalie to sing. One of them stepped forward and said, We are very pleased to take over the business here and hope we can make everything even better. We don't plan to change the staff. There is only one change. He approached Natalie, took her hand, and led her to the center of the hall. This girl will no longer wash dishes. People should enjoy her voice. Natalie, your new job is only on stage. I wish you good luck. She stood there, not believing her ears. Happiness and joy literally overflowed her. After a moment's pause, everyone clapped, and for her, it was a great encouragement. Natalie could finally do what she loved and earn a good salary in addition to the pleasure. The investors gradually started renovating the restaurant, closing one of the three dining rooms at a time, rather than the whole place. They expanded the menu, changed the interior, and the venue began to attract many more guests. Whereas music used to be only on weekends, Natalie sang almost every evening now. For the first time in her life, she had decent money. She could finally afford to indulge herself. The first thing she did was pay for her son's sessions with a psychologist at the daycare. She also found a good speech therapist. She took him to swimming lessons twice a week and to a developmental center three times a week. She was doing everything she could to make up for lost time. Nicholas did not react to her new job the way she expected. He wasn't happy for her. On the contrary, the more successful she became, the more dissatisfied and angry he was. Everything irritated him. Natalie had the impression that he was deliberately looking for things to complain about. 
She was now at home more often, everything was clean and tidy, and she cooked delicious meals each time. Moreover, she brought home several times more money than her husband. But still, he would complain. So, a star has emerged. Is it really a job to entertain drunk patrons in the evenings? You'd be better off as a supermarket cashier, close to home and with groceries. He constantly tried to convince Natalie that without education and experience, she only belonged as a janitor or dishwasher. He didn't even consider how hurtful his words were. One would think that with such unexpected work success, her husband would be happy, but it only seemed to annoy him more. Meanwhile, his own situation at the company was getting more and more difficult every day. It seemed her success was bothering him. Nicholas had been facing constant conflicts with management for months. While getting travel expenses for his department's employees, he managed to spend half of it on his mistress, hoping to cover the debts somehow later. The accounting department demanded reports, he took out loans, then took out more under reporting documents, and delayed repayment as long as possible. He, of course, did not tell his wife about this, so Natalie couldn't understand the reason for his constant dissatisfaction and nervous breakdowns. She couldn't even imagine that Nicholas had a mistress. Meanwhile, the mistress, knowing of her existence, decided to see the singing rival in person. Nicholas had let slip during one of their meetings that his wife had become a restaurant singer, so Stephanie wanted to visit the place. She wasn't sure how she would behave, but she was eager to assert herself, to unsettle the naive woman who was unaware of her husband's infidelity. That evening, the restaurant was packed, all the tables were occupied. However, she was lucky, a waitress politely found a spot for her right next to the stage. While placing her order, Stephanie, almost casually, asked, Can you tell me, does Natalie work here? I heard she performs as a singer on your stage. The young waitress was very chatty and seemed to envy Natalie's success. Smiling, she said quietly, Oh, she's not really a singer. She's a dishwasher. She just got lucky that the foreigners picked her. If they paid me that kind of money, I'd sing too. At that moment, soft music started playing and the waitress added, Oh, you can see this star now, it's her turn. Taking Stephanie's order, the waitress left, and Stephanie waited for Natalie's performance. After the first song, Natalie said into the microphone, Good evening, my dear and beloved audience. Tonight, I will sing for you, and if anyone has a favorite song, I'm ready to perform requests, and with that, she began to sing again. Stephanie's mind was already working on a plan. She asked the waitress to bring a piece of paper and a pen, and with a smile, she started writing something. When the last chords of the song ended, Stephanie got up and approached the stage. Smirking, she looked Natalie straight in the eyes and handed her the note. Here's the first request, said the unsuspecting singer, taking the note from her hands. She unfolded it and read, Oh, this song about love and infidelity is very familiar to me. Natalie was about to start singing when suddenly one of the investors from a nearby table stood up and, approaching Stephanie, shouted, Security. Call security. This thief has my wife's bracelet. It was stolen a week ago right from the apartment we rented. Stephanie tried to pull her hand away, where the bracelet Nicholas had given her glistened with green snake eyes. Are you out of your mind? This is my bracelet, and no one stole it. Is it the only one in the world? The man tightened his grip on her hand and, maintaining his tone, said, It's a custom-made piece. There are no others like it. Thief. Call the police. Everyone in the hall watched the scene in silence. The arriving security guards took Stephanie by the arms and led her out. Natalie took a break and continued her performance for the rest of the evening. It wasn't until she was leaving for home that she learned the girl with the bracelet had been taken to the police. At that moment, she couldn't even imagine how this whole story would turn out for her. Once outside, she almost immediately forgot about the incident. But a few days later, when a police officer showed up at their home, she remembered the incident again. The appearance of the police officer at their apartment door and the accusation against Nicholas for stealing the same bracelet shocked her. 
It was like a terrible nightmare. Nicholas initially denied everything, but when he was told that his mistress had confessed to everything, he admitted that he had bought the bracelet from a pawn shop. The news about the mistress was devastating for Natalie. She immediately recalled how she had tried to help her husband, believing in his non-existent debt. Instead of spending the money on her son's treatment, she had given it to her husband, not knowing how he was spending it. The blow to her heart was not the last. A couple of days later, when she went to work, one of the investors, the same one who had recognized the bracelet, announced, We are forced to terminate your contract. There is no trust. We know that your husband gave the stolen bracelet to his mistress, and you could well have been his accomplice. Therefore, we don't want to risk the reputation of our establishment and ask you to leave immediately. Natalie tried to justify herself, explaining that she knew nothing about the mistress or the bracelet, but the new bosses were not interested in listening. How she managed to get home that day was a blur. Everything she had was suddenly gone. Her husband turned out to be an unfaithful liar, and her beloved job was irretrievably lost. She didn't know how to move forward. Nicholas was constantly at the police station, appearing almost every day due to subpoenas. He couldn't prove his innocence. Fearing that Natalie would find the receipt for the bracelet, he had thrown it away on the first day and now couldn't confirm his story. Natalie couldn't find a new job. Everywhere she went, she was turned down. On the verge of despair, she happened to see an ad. A roadside cafe in a neighboring town was hiring. She called immediately, found out that lodging was provided, quickly packed her things, and, taking her son with her, went to the bus station. The work was hard. From morning until evening, she had to help in the kitchen, peeling vegetables, washing dishes, scrubbing pots until they shone. But the salary was good. Natalie even found a nanny for her son, thanks to the administrator. Upon learning that she had come with a child, he immediately said, well, no one will let you bring him to work. There are no nearby daycares. But I can suggest someone to leave him with. Caroline Danson worked as a cleaner here. It became too hard for her. She's in her 70s now, so she's staying home alone. She's a kind soul. I think she won't refuse, and you can pay her a little and maybe help her around the house. He introduced them, and the women quickly became friends. The old lady lived across the street in a small but very well-kept house. In the mornings, Natalie would drop by to leave her son with her, and in the evenings, when she returned, she would bring groceries if needed and have coffee with her, sharing the news. Natalie, you've really breathed new life into me. The grandmother would say warmly, I was going crazy with loneliness. Now, Jeffrey and I have fun all day long. Natalie tried not to think about Nicholas, though it was hard to avoid. The wound he had inflicted constantly reminded her of itself, bringing up memories from the past. When she learned that the girl caught with the bracelet at the restaurant was Nicholas's mistress, she tried to recall her, but couldn't. Nicholas had called only once after the family's departure, asking for money. You see, with all these trips to the police, I'm hardly at work, he said in a tragic voice. I'm afraid I might get fired. And you're still working. After a brief pause, he added, almost apologetically, but I'll pay everything back as soon as it's all over. Natalie was shocked by his words. He didn't even ask how or where they were living, what they were eating, or how her son was. It was unclear how he even knew she had found a job. Then she suddenly remembered that when she was leaving, she had met a neighbor and told her where and why she was going. Apparently, that neighbor had passed the information to Nicholas. However, he hadn't bothered to look for them until he was in a bind. After listening to him, Natalie responded sharply. Ask your mistress. I'm sure she has more than one gift from you. Maybe she can pawn something to help you out, she said, hanging up, feeling a sense of relief. Indeed, she no longer cared about what happened to him. She didn't want to think about it anymore and decided to live only for herself and her son. Exactly a week after her husband's call, Natalie was informed that Nicholas had been hit by a car while returning from one of the interrogations right outside the police station. Natalie wanted to tell the caller that she didn't want to know anything about the scoundrel, but the voice said, 
Your husband is on his deathbed and may not survive. I advise you to come as soon as possible. At that moment, Natalie suddenly felt sorry for him and, taking leave from work, rushed to the city. But it was too late. Nicholas had passed away without regaining consciousness. We did everything we could, said the attending physician, but the injuries were incompatible with life. Natalie went outside and, sitting on a bench at the entrance, burst into tears. At that moment, she genuinely felt sorry for her husband. She remembered how they had met, how well they had lived in the first years, and perhaps, if it hadn't been for the appearance of the mistress, they would have continued living like that. After sitting there for a while, Natalie remembered that to obtain the death certificate, she needed to find his passport, and she went to the apartment. As soon as she crossed the threshold, she couldn't hold back her tears. Everything in the house reminded her that just recently a family, their family, had lived there. Knowing where her husband kept his documents, she went to the room. Opening the desk drawer, the first thing she noticed was a white envelope. Carefully opening it, Natalie took out a letterhead and started reading. The letters danced before her eyes, and swaying, she sank into a nearby chair. Before her was Nicholas's will. And the worst part was that his only asset, this apartment, was bequeathed to none other than the mistress. Natalie was choked with resentment. It turned out that Nicholas had erased everything between them. He thought that she and their son had no right to inheritance. It was as if he had anticipated his demise and left this will. Otherwise, as his spouse, she would have received everything by law. But at that moment, Natalie wasn't thinking about the inheritance or the apartment. She was only thinking about how Nicholas had treated them. Returning from the city, she sat for a long time with Caroline Danson, weeping and recounting the injustice of life. The old lady just sighed and, patting her head like a child, said, Well, don't worry, my poor child, it will all pass. Time heals, and there will be a celebration on your street too. As for the apartment, don't worry about it. You can live with me. The house is big, and there's enough room for everyone. I have no relatives, and you and Jeffrey are like family to me. At that moment, Natalie couldn't even imagine what was happening at her old job at the restaurant. In the director's office, an online meeting was in full swing. The enraged foreign boss was shouting at the investors. How could you fire her? Are you out of your mind? She's a real star. You can't even imagine how many views her videos get abroad. Find her coordinates, no matter where, but I want them all by tomorrow. The men exchanged glances, and one, as if making excuses, said. But there was suspicion that she was involved in the theft. Not waiting for the response, the boss yelled again. I have plenty of suspicions too, but I'm not firing you. Give me the information by tomorrow. When, a few days later, a distinguished man in an expensive suit appeared at the roadside cafe and asked to see Natalie, everyone was astonished. They rarely had such distinguished guests in their establishment. Mostly, long-haul truckers or passing travelers came here. When Natalie came out to the hall, she thought the man's face looked familiar. Asking her to sit at a table, he smiled and said with an accent, You probably don't remember me. I'm the one for whom you dedicated a song in the video in a foreign language back when you were asked to sing. Hello, let's get acquainted. My name is Michael, and I flew here today from another country just for you. The man stood up and, approaching Natalie, gallantly kissed her hand. Your voice has an overwhelming success in our country, so I came to offer you a collaboration. You belong in show business. Well, didn't you realize that by now? Michael offered very enticing terms, but Natalie, having once trusted foreigners, was now afraid to trust again. However, the guest was persistent, and after much persuasion, she agreed. On one hand, it was frightening to change anything. But on the other hand, she understood perfectly well that such a chance might not come again. As soon as she gave her consent, Michael said, Excellent. Then let's resign, and today I will move you and your son to a rental apartment. We'll get the documents ready. Don't worry about the money, you'll have everything. Natalie looked at him in fear, but he, immediately understanding what she was afraid of, laughed and added. 
No, no, don't worry. You and your son will live alone in that apartment. I won't bother you. Unless, of course, you want me to. I'll wait for you and want you to be in the city today, not slaving away in this dive. She blushed and said quietly, Okay, fine. But I need to get ready and pick up my son from Caroline Danson. Michael waited for her, and by the evening, Natalie and Jeffrey were entering a spacious apartment in the city center. The man carefully brought in her suitcase and, smiling, said, You'll find fruits, vegetables, and other essentials in the refrigerator. I hope my assistants bought everything you need. Rest, and tomorrow we'll go get your passport and visa. He left, and Natalie realized she found this foreigner quite charming. He had so much charisma that she didn't want to part with him at all. She also mentally imagined herself back on stage, and her heart sang at the thought. At that moment, it seemed to her that a bright streak was returning to her life. But at the same time, a few blocks away from that apartment, Stephanie was crying. It seemed that not long ago, she was surrounded by the attention of two lovers and living in luxury. Flowers, gifts, and restaurant outings made her life a never-ending celebration. But everything turned upside down in an instant. First, there was the story with the stupid bracelet, the police call, the scandal with Ernest, who found out about the rival. Stephanie thought he would kill her. Then Nicholas's death. And finally, the news that she was pregnant. Stephanie wept from hopelessness and resentment towards fate, not knowing what to do next. She couldn't even say who the father of the child was. At that time, she had been dating both Ernest and Nicholas simultaneously. It was as if Stephanie and Natalie had swapped places. Now Stephanie was unhappy and lonely, while Natalie's life, on the contrary, was improving. Natalie's career abroad quickly took off, thanks to Michael. A month after her move, he invited her to a restaurant where, kneeling, he said, Natalie, from the first moment I saw you, I couldn't forget you. You are the best, and I really want you to be my wife. Tears welled up in Natalie's eyes. She couldn't have dreamed of this. Michael took such good care of her and her son that it was impossible not to fall in love. Without hesitation, Natalie accepted his proposal, and a few weeks later, they had their wedding in the most luxurious restaurant. Natalie felt like the happiest woman at that moment. She had a reliable, kind, and very gentle man by her side who also adored her son. Jeffrey, in turn, never left Michael's side, affectionately calling him Papa Michael. Natalie sometimes even thought they looked alike. In a short time, she became a well-known singer with her photo gracing magazine covers. Her husband took care of her promotion and advertising, genuinely sharing her joy. Fans bombarded Natalie with letters, flowers, and gifts, and Michael just joked. Well, with this many admirers, I'll soon be standing in line to confess my love to my own wife. But Natalie always responded that she loved only him, and they would read the love notes together, laughing at the admirers. One day, among all the emails, Natalie received a rather strange letter. At first, she didn't recognize who it was from. But after reading it a few times, she realized it was from the same mistress of Nicholas to whom he had left his will. Stephanie wrote that she had given birth to a son who might be Nicholas's child. She also mentioned that she didn't want the child and had already written a refusal at the hospital. Natalie and Michael sat in silence for a few minutes, after which he suddenly said, We need to fly there and get that boy. He might end up in an orphanage. We can't let that happen. Natalie hugged her husband and whispered, How I love you. Michael kissed her and gently said, You are my life and I will do everything to make sure you and our son, or rather, now two sons, are happy. Natalie moved away from her husband and, smiling mysteriously, said, Not two, but three. Or two sons and a daughter. I'm pregnant. She expected any reaction from her husband, but what happened next was beyond her imagination. Michael cried and laughed at the same time. He would lift her in his arms, spin her around the room, and then start kissing her like a madman. 